their financial success. Now think about the railroads, they like monopolize industries, and then think about the farmers that need the railroad for their livelihood. So you're a farmer in Nebraska, how else are you going to get your stuff to the market? You're going to walk it there? I mean, you have no options other than the railroad. So they are overly dependent on the railroad, which is kind of weird because they need the railroad, yet the railroad starts to rip them off because they know that without the railroad, they're done. So think about this. The railroads, remember those land grants? They got all that land. Oftentimes they keep a chunk of that land and they charge the farmers to warehouse all of their crop. It's like, oh, you need to store your corn? Well, we're going to charge you X amount each month. More money from the farmer going into the pockets of the railroads. How much do the railroads then charge the farmer to send their stuff to market? A ton. Too much. So the farmers just aren't making it. So they end up hating the railroad. The government, they're like, eh, hands off, laissez-faire. We'll help the railroads on their path to success, but farmers you're not going to get much help. In fact, remember Grover Cleveland's big old quote? Farmers in Texas struggling, they need a seed bill. Uh, the government supports them, or it's, support the government. You must support the government, but we're not going to support you. And that's kind of the trend. While they do help out the big businesses, the farmers are left to struggle for themselves. So you know what the farmers start to do? They organize. They form something called the Grange which is simply the farmers getting involved in politics. Now pause for a second because last week I kind of told you the, the end game. I told you when the farmers were really involved politically, they had a national party and they actually won electoral votes. What was that? This is 20 years before that. So this is the beginning. This is farmers getting involved in politics and simply put, the farmers end up getting involved locally and they end up controlling certain states, like a Nebraska. A farming-based state that has all farmers is run by farmers. And now that they have control of the state, look what they do. They regulate the railroads. They say, railroads, you must be fair to the farmers. You can't rip us off, you can't overcharge, you can't have a monopoly, you gotta do this, you gotta do that and they get a court case that says they're allowed to do it. So they're high-fiving each other, they're celebrating their regulation of the railroads on a statewide level. Those are Granger laws, yes, I probably have a term about that. So they're celebrating this on the short term, but it's not a happy ending. What's the federal government gonna do? Let the railroads do what they want. The federal government steps up and it's like, states, you're regulating the railroad? You can't do that. The Wabash case overturns this, and the federal government simply says, states, you can't regulate the railroad. That's up to us. And then the federal government, when it's up to regulating the railroad, you know what they do? Let the big they look the other way and don't do it. So think about how messed up this is for the farmer. The farmer will continue to struggle. So the farmer is going to be just left out there for a long time. The life of a farmer is not really going to be all that wonderful. Uh, Wabash overturns Mun v. Illinois, and the railroads basically go unregulated until who is president? Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt will finally start to regulate the railroads. But prior to Teddy, they could do whatever they wanted, and the farmer is going to struggle. So I know a lot of wordy stuff on that slide two court cases. You might have to study that. You might have to flashcard those. I'm sure I have quizlets over Mun v. Illinois, victory for farmers. This is a slap in the face of farmers because it overturns that and gives the power to the federal government, and then the federal government does nothing. Get it? How about the big evil companies, the trusts, the monopolies? Does the federal government regulate any of these monopolies? Kind of is my answer. So the federal government, Congress actually passed something because people were complaining that, hey, these monopolies are unfair. And again, when you have a monopoly, you charge whatever you want to. You might not be looking out for the well-being of the public. Remember my gas station monopoly example? I'm going to charge you $10 a gallon because I can. 
because I don't have any competition. Well, Congress passed this thing saying that, oh, we can break up monopolies, but they don't. It's a little piece of paper going to fight these big companies. That little piece of paper doesn't do much until who is president? Teddy Roosevelt. You know Teddy Roosevelt's nickname? The Trust Buster. He's the first to break up all of these evil monopolies. So just kind of think about it. The government passes some stuff, but then they just look the other way until Teddy Roosevelt is president. Roosevelt will regulate the railroads. Roosevelt will break up trust. Prior to TR, nobody did anything. They just looked the other way and let big business kind of run the show. Make sense? Good times? Question. So it did, it said that like that's what would happen, but they didn't do anything yes. about it? Yes, yes. Uh, you could say that companies just found loopholes in the law. It didn't have enough teeth to force them to comply. What else do we have? Oh, an evaluation of these robber barons or titans of industry. Uh, use your favorite word to an extent. Are these guys all corrupt? Some of them are. That Jay Gould guy was really corrupt. They would use bribery. Jay Gould tried to bribe the president. That's pretty corrupt, right? Or do you look at them as these like successful innovators finding new ways to do things? Andrew Carnegie? He uses the Bessemer process. It innovates how steel is made. Uh, John D. Rockefeller innovates how oil is used. All these guys innovate some way, somehow. And then they end up giving away a whole lot of money once they become super rich. So it's like a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that. They use ruthless tactics to get their wealth. John D. Rockefeller in achieving his monopoly on uh, oil refineries, you know his famed quote? Let us pray, as in P-R-E-Y. Let us pray on our competition. Let's find that weak competitor. Let's find their weakness and drive them out. So just think about it. Are these guys the most ethical businessmen ever? Not necessarily. If you're looking to prey on your competition, you're going to buy them out. Remember the example I gave of how they could use uh, their money and wealth to drive someone out of business? If Trevor wants to compete with me with my gas station, what can I do to drive him out of business? I can slash my price to nothing. I can take a short-term loss. I can force him out of business if I feel like it. And John D. Rockefeller would use those tactics. Yet, when they get super rich, John D. Rockefeller ends up giving away hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, Andrew Carnegie. Can you think of anything kind of attached to the Carnegie name right now? Carnegie Hall, he gives all that money. Carnegie funds every public library. Carnegie Mellon University, he starts a college. Do any of those railroad guys start colleges? Vanderbilt. Leland Stanford in California, another one. So think about it. They're weird in that they achieve success through some corruption or ruthless business tactics, but then once they're successful, they give away a whole lot of money. So are they those evil railroad corporations running over everyone, destroying everything? Are they so large they're powering over the government? To an extent. It's your go-to answer. It'll help you a lot. All right. Thomas Edison, different <coughs> tactic here, different uh, inventor. He, in fact, invents a ton of different things. You probably know his most famous invention, the light bulb. So Thomas Edison and the light bulb, this one's going to have some major economic consequences. Now that I'm a factory and I can light my factory uh, at night, what am I going to do? You're going to have to work at night. So they're going to end up working 24 hours a day, producing a whole lot of stuff. In the life of a worker, by the way, you're either working the 6 to 6 shift or the 6 to 6 shift. 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. 12 hours a day, 6 hours a week. That's the life of a worker in the Gilded Age. The whole eight hour work day, they're not gonna get that until later. So you're generally going 12 hours a day, you still would get Sundays off for the most part. His invention of the light bulb, by the way, tries thousands of times, he fails. You guys always know some stories about Thomas Edison, right? You ever see that quote? 
I've not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. He said that in his repeated failure of trying to get that light bulb to, to be effective. But maybe you guys can look at that quote and apply it to your grades or your life. <laughs> you're not really failing, you're just finding a way that's not effective for you. If you continually get 62s on all of my quizzes and tests, don't do the same thing. Go the Thomas Edison route, find a different way to prepare. Now you can use Quizlet, do something else. But anyway, I like that quote. What else does he invent? Don't worry about writing it down. Oh, the phonograph, like a early record player of sorts. Note that it's not playing a spinning record. It's gonna like have a crank and it's gonna play music that way and it's gonna project it by sound. That's an Edison invention. This thing records your voice so you can like record early lectures. Maybe there were some innovative teachers that were doing that. This is a preacher recording his sermons and they could replay that. That's an Edison invention. You know any other Edison inventions? Yeah, the motion picture camera, that's Thomas Edison as well. So lots and lots of Edison inventions, and if we go beyond Edison, can you give me one more inventor from that era? Alexander Graham Bell, what's he invent? Telephone, fun fact, the first words ever spoken on the telephone. Do you know? Watson, come here, I want you. First words ever on the phone. He was like calling Watson his assistant in the other room. Watson, come here, I want you. <laughs> anyway, with all these inventions, here's the story behind it. You get the typewriter, you get the telephone, you get the camera. You need a factory to make typewriters, right? You need a factory to make telephones. You need a factory to do all this. Who's gonna work them? Sears. Who's gonna work in the factories? <laughs> Immigrants, people, kids, whoever. But this is the economy growing. Every new invention has a new industry created with it. So think of all of the money attached and the opportunity that might go along with some of these new inventions. With a typewriter, you might get secretaries. Who's generally gonna be a secretary? Women. Telephones, do you know how an early telephone would work? Yeah, you pick up the phone and you get an operator. So someone says, who can I connect you to? And then you say, and then they've got a master switchboard and they like connect a few wires. That would be another job for women. As for the camera, that's gonna change journalism. Now that you can see this stuff, wait till you see the impact coming up. What are the thousands, what are the thousands of inventions? What are the other thousands of inventions? Oh, I don't know. But now that you have all these new products, they will come to market, right? So jobs for women, you got another job of like marketing, like, ooh, you need to buy this new product, this is the best product ever. So you'll see some door-to-door -door salesmen, you'll see it in magazines, and then Montgomery Ward or Sears will capitalize on this and they'll take their store on the road. How do you take a store with everything on the road? Do you know? You use the railroad, but you simply ship your magazine. Everything is mail order. Trevor, right above you is a Sears catalog from 1893. That red book, top of the shelf, we'll play a fun game here. So this is what everyone would have access to, a Sears catalog. Just point to something randomly and see what you just ordered. Uh, enameled thumbs of veterans. Awesome. Try another one. Ooh, excited. you could order a house. I mean, that's a 1,500 page book with anything and everything that is yours. So you could live in nowhere in Nebraska and order a house. You could live nowhere and then get everything sent to you, so. Wait, 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 horses? Oh, that's a hard, it's only $15? Yeah, but you gotta adjust for inflation. $15 would be very expensive. That would be uh, maybe 600. For a, for a harness. So that would be pretty expensive, but you can adjust things for inflation. Those were the actual prices there. So anyway, lots of money flooding into the United States as a result of these new innovations. That's kind of your take on it. And then again, a little bit of an impact on women. Uh, types of businesses. So you have your new typewriter company. You have your new camera company. You have your oil company. They find ways to make more money. 
So first you can integrate vertically, which means you cut out the middleman. That's the best way that I can explain this, or maybe I can explain it best by looking at what Amazon is doing today. You're all familiar with Amazon.com, right? Do you see the latest trend of what Amazon is trying to cut out because they pay too much for it? So what are they doing? They're hiring their own people, they're buying their own trucks, and they're buying their own fleet of planes. So they don't have to pay the post office or FedEx and UPS, they've got it themselves. Oh, so that's why there's like those Amazon cars. That's why there's those new Amazon cars. And then later we're looking at drone delivery, which will cut out a whole lot of costs. So that's what vertical integration is. And these titans of the Gilded Age were masters of this. Rockefeller did it with his company, Andrew Carnegie. What's Andrew Carnegie's company? So how can you cut out the middleman with the steel industry? The miners. He would own the mines. So you find an iron ore mine, and then you buy it. You pay those miners so you don't have to outsource to another company. Um, another current event example would be like Walmart. Walmart is uh, vertically integrating throughout you know, their entire business career. As for this one, it's still done, but the end result is a monopoly. You horizontally integrate by buying out your competition. You're seeing that right now with the cable industry. Uh, AT&T and Time Warner and Comcast, and they're like all becoming one mega company. That's horizontal integration. Now again, if they get too big and the government says they're unfair, the government will break you up. Uh, anything in your lifetime ever be, been broken up? <laughs> Good one. Mine too. Uh, Microsoft is the answer. So Microsoft, if you bought any computer like in the early you know, 2000s, it would be preloaded with all Microsoft software and the government eventually said, wait, that's not fair. We need to open the door for competition. So they broke that up. So if the government decides that your company is too big and too powerful, they might break you up if you've horizontally integrated too much. How does the government do that? They have like a trade commission. They're so, like, but like, what do they do with the company? Like, all right, you're split in half. That's how they have to go make your own yeah. company. Yeah. So, Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller's company, once owned 90% of all of the oil refineries that were out there. Uh, when it was broken up, they made 12 separate companies that were all like once Standard Oil. I'm guessing one of your parents works for Exxon, which was part of Standard Oil. But you still have a standard company. You've got all these other big oil companies that were once standard oil. So it, they just create competition. What else do we have? Ooh, the standard oil octopus. So have you ever seen this cartoon before? The standard oil octopus. This is one uh, th that always seems to make its way into test questions, where you have like this evil looking octopus with the oil derrick, standard oil. Its tentacles are like strangling everything in its path, including the government. It looks like it's got, uh, I don't know, Congress. It's getting its tentacles on the White House. It's strangling the people. Clearly, the cartoonist does not like standard oil, right? You ever see a current event version of this? Yeah. yeah. So they did make that current event Donald Trump version of it. Um, kind of interesting that it's based on history with his tentacles on, you know, the Supreme Court and Congress. Other tentacles, they, I don't know, bring in some current event stuff like Twitter and a mirror for like narcissism, nukes, and then like rather than strangling, shuffling them in the White House. But I don't know, I kind of look at it with the impact of political cartooning. And I would say back then it has much more impact than it would today. Back then, these things would be uh, circulated in just about every newspaper. Today, how many of you have seen that before? Do they still make political cartoons? Yeah. Obviously. Yeah, and they're in the newspaper. Twitter. But how many of you still get the newspaper at your house? I'm guessing like two of you. So think about that. Back in the day, you got your news from the newspaper and that's it. So, so many more people were exposed to political cartoons. Today, it's like, 
you got to have somebody send it to you on Twitter or whatever to be exposed to this. What else do we have? All these guys. Big three, Carnegie, Rockefeller, Morgan. Some pictures to go with their names. You familiar with like what each of them will do? Andrew Carnegie, what's his industry? Steel. Steel. Let me ask the next question. What city is his headquarters? You can figure this out. No, not Utah. It's like, isn't it Pittsburgh? It is Pittsburgh. How did you figure that out? I watched a documentary on it. Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> or you think about the Pittsburgh Steelers. NFL teams can sometimes help you figure out some history. Sometimes. Detroit Lions, there's no real like lion history there. But Pittsburgh Steelers, that's his. As a J.P. Morgan, he's like the banker banker. Uh, the one who bailed out the government when we went broke in the 1890s. He ends up buying out Andrew Carnegie. And they end up creating the first billion dollar corporation ever, which was U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel was the first billion dollar corporation ever, which is kind of interesting because just recently we've had the first trillion dollar corporation ever. Just recently, like this was in the news this morning, as I'm driving to work, I'm listening to the first trillion dollar corporation ever, which was what? Bingo. So first billion dollar corporation ever with U.S. Steel, first trillion dollar corporation now with Apple, but yeah, the news hit that uh, Apple's projections were not looking all that good. I guess you guys aren't upgrading your iPhones enough. They're expensive. Yeah. They're, they are expensive. <laughs> and people are saying that Apple hasn't like innovated enough to, to make it desirable for y'all. But I found that kind of interesting that it was in they the news. They write down all these names. They're in the... I would. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Yeah. Christina, we're going to interrupt you for just sure. one second. I know this is meaningful, what you're learning about, you know, million dollar, million dollar businesses and stuff. But actually, we're here to celebrate Mr. Taylor. Uh, Mr. Taylor, I had to turn in uh, about five to seven irreplaceable teachers at Tomball High School, and I named you as one of those. Do oh. you all think Mr. Taylor does a great job? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. And so uh, we're here, this, Mr. McKenna and Dr. Dr. Z here to we talk a little bit more about what we're trying to do. But just celebrate you for just a couple minutes here uh, to recognize you and thank you. Well, so thank you. we wanted to take time on behalf of the entire school district to recognize some Tomball ISD MBTs. Tomball ISD most valuable teachers and when we put the all call out to our principals uh, within just a few minutes we got responses back and what we're looking for is people that are change agents and difference makers that plan very purposely and work relentlessly and so we thank you because we know our teachers can go anywhere else in the state of Texas and teach and they stay here Tomball High School and Tomball Independent School District so a round of applause to you sir we appreciate it. So we're going to give him a little assignment that you all may help him with, and that's to write down two or three things he does on a daily basis to be such a rock star. We're going to step out, then we're going to come back in, and if it's okay with you, we can take a big group picture, huddle up, and then, uh, and then we do have a certificate for you that will be coming soon. And uh, but we'd love to get a picture of y'all together. Fair enough. Good. You know, it's impromptu, but right? you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, no problem. Oh my God. <laughs> Yeah, my movie club. Yeah. So you know what to do on that. So you, you, you can write something. Oh, you, you can write. Yeah, you just oh, oh, I write something. Yeah, two or three things you do on a daily yes. basis. Oh, okay. Yep. Uh, you want this? You want that color? Yeah. Okay. You can show your wife this video. I can, I can record it next period as well. If we're a little bit behind. Might be a better idea. Okay. We'll be right back in about five minutes. Or so. Okay, so All just right. write Thank things you. Sorry that. Sorry uh, for the interruption. Just things you do to be a rock star. Okay, with y'all could help. With us. some of your help here. <laughs> that was just weird. Why did you have like a little avatar? I thought I was gonna get like a, a gift bag. <laughs> I wanted to take no. I don't know. Give me something to write down here. Humor. Humor? Funny jokes. Fun facts. Fun facts. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah. Hold on, what else? What else? Innovative learning techniques, they're going to yeah. like that one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> we need to appeal to the audience. McCoy's what? lectures. YouTube <laughs> yeah. star. YouTube star. <laughs> YouTube star. Put that. YouTube star. Yeah, are you monetizing? How many minutes do you get on average? Surprisingly, a lot. Like, like one of those YouTube videos, there were 150 that looked at it. So maybe I'm going viral. <laughs> so you put YouTube star on there. <laughs> Humor, fun facts, innovative learning techniques. YouTube star. I put technology. No. 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 You have to put a YouTube. Grizzly. Youth influencer. Motivational speaker. Good storytelling. Uh, I do find ways to make money. I was hoping I was going to. Put what? Thrifter. Put thrifter in Michigan. Yeah. Put thrifter in Michigan. That's all. Make it sound so like. Labo doodle enthusiast. Labo doodle enthusiast. Can't they come back yet? I don't know. I wrote. Anything else? Lino was thinking cute. Lino, you got something? Tanner was like, you say cute. And he was like, Tanner, say it. I was like, I'm not saying that. I've had to yell at Tanner a few times. Understanding of Tanner's. I do understand you. I kind of get along with you. I kind of get along with you. That's a good one. Which one? Understanding. Understanding? Understanding? Should we just stop this video? Is that what we're going to do? I don't know. This is weird enough and awkward enough where we might as well just let it go. I think you should upload this to YouTube as well. It's a nice little surprise. This is for all those like scholar physics students that are gone and they, they've like asked me to record my lectures. So I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I'll do it. But I'll do it next period just in case you're behind. Watch the last 15 minutes or something. Why are you going to use the video of your lecture when I'm asking? Okay, wait, let's see if it's more. Humor, fun facts, innovative learning techniques, technology, YouTube, good storytelling, good relationship with students. Yeah, good relationship with Tanner. Anything else? Uplifting voice. Uplifting what? Voice. What? You said monotone? No. You're always available for us if we need you. Availability. Emotionally available. Available. We're ready. That makes it sound good. All right, we. You guys do well on your assignment. We yeah, did yeah. brainstorm. We we've got a few things. Here. Awesome. Okay. And so we're I gonna take get it, a I'm picture uh, with your teacher, oh. Mr. Scott, and then we're gonna group up. Fair enough. So do you want us to like move? Um. Are we just gonna? What do you think? What? Where? Uh, just Mr. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The time wall. Yeah. 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 Bring, your, bring this thing? Yeah. 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 Oh, we're going to watch So did we do a good job? We have to do one of those, like, off work hands Like politicians do. Y'all are good class. Awesome. Right. And now we want to mass aggregate all the students yeah. here. Yeah, that'd be great. Right, come on up, guys. Come on. This is how I'm on. Get, get cozy with Mr. Taylor and uh, get get a good get a squeeze in through the back and just sort of keep working your way in. I got one one round. Stop eating cereal with my heart. Do I have to be in the group? That's so bad. One of my teachers told me I look matching your needle. I know. We're not gonna all be in it. You have to be in it if you like. No, I'm gonna go in this row. You can be center. Yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. But your love. <laughs> yeah. well, well, just talk to your parents. Where do you want me? In the middle? Yeah, just, just talk to your parents and say, hey.
Yeah. So the guys in front of Mr. Taylor just gotta take a knee or yeah, just take a knee or something. Somewhere you can see him. Uh, there you go. Yeah, just squeeze in tighter, take a knee, guys. Get in there, ladies on the end, so we can get you the picture and awesome. Yeah. Okay, if I look this way, we'll take a couple. One, two, three. Say 